This is kind of quote unquote part two of the story that I started telling earlier, which was about well, the, the, the keynote was called What is DevOps Really? And it was really trying to, um, trying to, how should I put it? Trying to impart some of the experiences I've had with, you know, both myself and people uh, I've spoken to struggling with what DevOps really is supposed to be and whether they're doing it right or whether they're doing it wrong, or what exactly they should be doing and all kinds of rather dogmatic messaging around this is what DevOps should be and it shouldn't be this and you shouldn't be doing this and you shouldn't be doing this. And that's all very good and you know, I've, I've been guilty of this in the past myself, but it's not really that useful in terms of actually making stuff better for your own setup. And so I think we need to move beyond the, the dogma and the rants and we need to put ourselves in a position where we can try to impart, you know, like teach a man how to fish kind of thing um, so that we can actually figure out what it means for us. And that's really what this part of the talk is about. What I talked about on stage was kind of the background to this. You know, we're, we're really, I mean, it doesn't matter whether we're in dev or in ops, we're software developers now. Um, there's two main patterns that I think we see out there. Um, one of them, the, the dev capital O ops pattern with essentially two development departments working in a virtualized environment, communicating somehow more or less effectively is, is pretty common. And, and I think part of what we'll discuss today is that I think it's perfectly legitimate in some situations. Um, but it often gets shouted down as, yeah, but then you're not doing it right because your team is not one big team that loves each other kind of thing. Um, and so that's the, you know, that's the having an integrated development team. And, and even though I said what I said just now sounds a bit ironic, there are definitely occasions where that makes a lot of sense and where that is the best way to address your challenges. So we want to talk a little bit about what that looks like. Um, and then, yeah, I, I ended up by saying, OK, it's all very well to, to be told there are two approaches out there. Um, but what everybody needs to do now, if you're either in the middle of this or if you're beginning, is figure out which one really works best for you. And that's really what we're going to try and do today. And we'll get to the agenda. Well, here's the agenda for, for this particular session. So if we talk about DevOps with a capital O, talk about like providing a platform. Um, what does that actually boil down to? What does that platform look like? Um, what are some things that we can learn about how to build that particular platform? Um, you know, what are the deployment models that come with that? And that's where our, kind of my, our professional area of expertise comes in. We make tools in this space so we can talk a lot about how we see people doing that effectively. Um, flash photography, highly encouraged, by the way, if you want to take pictures of me and tweet them, I'm, I'm all for that. Um, the other approach, obviously, as well, you know, one plus one equals three. What does it mean to have an integrated development team? What, did, what kind of deliverable practices and what, what do we actually end up shipping? How do we end up doing that? What are some of the challenges? What are some of the benefits? Um, some, some ideas around finding the right approach that, that can work for you. Um, uh, and then, you know, it's all very well to talk about what we're going to be doing and how to choose the right approach and so on. But, we should really all have an idea of why we're doing it. Um, and again, I don't think there's one right answer, but this is something we really need to be aware of because this is the, maybe the thing I say most often, whether it's DevOps or Agile or continuous delivery or Docker or whatever the technology is that you're looking at, by and large, these technologies are not goals in themselves. They are means to achieving a certain goal. And goals look different for different people, different dimensions of the organization and so on. But we need to have the goal in mind. And then you know, enough of the theory and, and, and the, the, the trade-offs and all that kind of stuff. Obviously, you know, I, I don't just want to stand here and talk at you for 35 minutes, and then everybody goes, and now back to the real world, and we'll just keep doing what we're doing. I would hopefully like everybody to come out if you're thinking, OK, I, I have some new data points that I can either work on and agree with or disagree with or whatever. But there's something I can take away from this and actually put into practice when I go back to work tomorrow or on Monday or whatever. One other thing I'm going to do that's maybe a little uh, unusual, so I'll give you a bit of a heads up warning about this, is I've inserted some pauses into this presentation because there are certain parts where rather than just rushing on to the next segment, I would like, I think it makes sense for us to all take 15 seconds or 20 seconds or whatever and think about what our own particular thing is because otherwise you'll end up with like 40 slides that have you've seen go by it's like a train ride and then you know you arrive and you've forgotten the scenery along the way and I don't think that's well that's not the, the, the most productive thing we can do so there's a me 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 slide blah I'm not going to talk about myself in a lot of detail you can find this I'm sure the slide deck will be online um, 
I'm the VP products for Zebia Labs. Um, so that basically makes me a PowerPoint developer. Um, I still develop for real um, uh, between 10 and 2 in the morning with some crazy hours. It only works because my girlfriend is also a software developer, so she understands. Um, yeah, so I, I contribute to a bunch of open source projects. Uh, I, I work a lot in the Scala community and the Java communities. I try to keep real with, with stuff that's actually happening because PowerPoint is all fluff. Um, no, I didn't say that because uh, our head of marketing is at the back, so I didn't say that. Anyway. Um, so I've been on both sides of the fence, and I, I do a lot of work in this space. Um, who are we? Well, uh, I'm, I unfortunately didn't make it out to the conference until today, but I've heard that a lot of you, I don't know how many in this room, but a lot of people at the conference uh, were very interested in the stuff we do. We make tools um, to support DevOps and continuous delivery at scale. So like in a nutshell, it's you know, not the thing that's going to be the thing for you if you're five college kids in a dorm and you're starting up some servers on Amazon. It's going to be the thing that you need when you start to try and do this stuff in what I would call the real world. When you start to hit all the real world challenges, you know, multiple teams, different types of diversities, requirements around scalability, reporting, all this kind of stuff. That's what we're really good at. We have a bunch of tools in this space. Um, more than happy maybe in the question session to talk about them in a bit more detail. I'll use some of them as examples um, throughout the presentation. Um, and yeah, there's, there's some resource links at the end. And that, better not touch that. Um, that will give you some more information about, you know, if you want to learn more about us. Um, all right, go back to the agenda. What was the first thing we were going to talk about? Which DevOps, the notion of a platform. Um, this is not a new notion, um, and, and hence this, this mood picture, if you like. That's, um, you know, picking up food in a restaurant. You have a classic two teams, different responsibilities. One team is in the kitchen. They're making the food. Um, they prepare it, and then there's a handover, a defined handover space, which is, I don't know what it's called. Like the, I was searching for like kitchen, pickup, waiter, restaurant, something. This is kind of what comes out. That's where the next team you know, picks up and continues and takes the stuff into the runtime environment, which is where the customers are, and then they eat the food. So this is not, as I said, there's nothing unique about this. There's a well-defined information flow and so on. Um, this is an idea that we can apply, of course, to the delivery of software ours, uh, as well. Um, and, and I think one thing you'll, well, if you see anything else I've spoken about, one recurring theme that you'll find me talking about is what we're doing with software is just supply chain like with anything else. Like we're not solving unique problems. They're pretty unique in the software world, but the notion of having a more efficient process of getting stuff to, to market, if you like, to our customers is not a new thing. Like supply chain in, in car companies or whatever has been doing this for decades. So there's lots of experiences and analogies we can apply. Let's talk about platforms a little bit. So typically what this, what this means is that you end up having two teams in your organization, um, an application development team and a platform team. Uh, the platform team can be called the ops team or the DevOps team or whatever, um, but they typically have two kinds of responsibilities. And, and note, either of the teams could be outsourced as well. So you may not have an app team in-house, you might be buying off-the-shelf products. And similarly, you might not have a platform team in-house, you might go to a pass vendor um, an OpenShift or a Cloud Foundry or something along those lines, in which case you're effectively outsourcing that part. But these two components exist. The ops platform team is responsible for, for, for providing a runtime environment, and that runtime environment should just kind of work. Um, the, the application team puts business logic and some configuration associated with it, like messaging queues or data sources or whatever else the app needs in order to run, on top of this platform. Um, platforms, one of the things we learned, going back to what I said earlier about this being a, uh, platform engineering is software engineering. So platforms should be versioned just like software is versioned. Um, OpenShift has different versions. Your own internal platform has different versions as well. It should have different versions as well. It's not a moving target. An application that runs against version 3.7 of your platform may not run against version 3.8. And you need to be able to reproduce 3.7 when you need to. And there might be cases where you need to run multiple versions of your platform concurrently in order to keep things up in the air. So that's just standard software development discipline applied to platform engineering. This is a pretty easy approach, as I said a few times, for organizations to take because it basically respects existing organizational boundaries. Now you have your ops team already, by and large. Um, they're already responsible for making stuff run. You have your development team, and they have their responsibilities, and there's an entire organizational structure around this VPs reporting hierarchies, 
um, you know, billing codes, all this kind of stuff that is kind of the, the baggage of, of process. It's not just the people. Um, they're located potentially in different places. So there's lots of reasons why this kind of approach is pretty easy to adopt versus one where you try to mingle the teams more, simply because the rest of the organization's ecosystem is pretty naturally set around this. And as surprising as this, this may sound, because developers always tend to complain that they can't do what they need, if you get this right, this is a very easy sell to developers because it just works. Now, that was the example I gave in the keynote. Somebody who was an organizer of DevOps days said he loves it because he now works at Google, and he just writes his app code, and he has no idea how it runs in production. And he regards it as a great thing. And the reason he regards it as a great thing is because he doesn't need to know, because it just works. The app doesn't fall over every five minutes. He doesn't have a ton of angry users saying, ah, oh, why it's taking so long, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, he can write the code that he needs to write, and so on. So there's a, the caveat here is you know, developers will love this model as long as it allows them to do what they need to do. If, of course, it only supports you know, one particular language, like Java 1.4 or something like that, and you can't have a database, then you're not going to have happy developers because so many of them need, uh, need these kind of components. So that also means that you know, when you're thinking about this as a, as a contract between the two, Try not to think of it as a contract between two adversarial parties. This shouldn't end up in another Cold War where you have two sites trying to face each other down. This is a, a contract more in the sense of, you know, like in, the, in that restaurant example, although there maybe you might say it's a Cold War, um, an agreed interface for the, for the benefit of both sides because then they can both reason about the same thing. They can both talk the same language. They both have fixed clearly described expectations and so on. So you know, the contract between these two should be a win-win thing rather than a zero-sum game where you know, benefit for one person is a loss for another person. So we should, in an organization that does this effectively, there is a continual dialogue about does the platform do what we need it to do? Because if you don't have this dialogue, then what happens is the developers who find that the platform doesn't do what they need it to do, they go around it. They try to cheat, and then you end up with 500 servers on Amazon that you never knew about. You know, we've all been there, I think. And that's what we want to avoid. So of course, you know, this is where the versioning part comes in. Um, certainly initially, it's unlikely that one platform will fit all. So you might have to think of multiple. Um, and you might say that this is only applicable to a certain part of our organization initially. That's all legitimate, I think. So this is no, don't take this as, if we're going to adopt this approach, there must be one platform, and everything must run on that platform. No. A, a non-zero percentage should, and hopefully a reasonably sizable percentage, but um, there definitely needs to be flexibility in this overall setup. In practical terms, so much for quote unquote the theory, this boundary, what does it look like? Um, it could be anywhere in the stack, if you like, but most of the time it looks a little bit like a pass. I don't know if you've worked with a, a pass, a Cloud Foundry, you know, the Docker's containers are a pass of a sort. Once you add a lot of other stuff to them, and they also define a boundary. But it's pretty close to the application code. You know, the, 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 what the developers can deliver and define usually revolves around application logic and application-related configuration. Requirements, in other words. If you've used a PaaS platform, I mean, in Docker, this would be a Docker file. If you've used like an OpenShift, there is an XML descriptor, or you get a code repo, and basically you can say, this is the code I want you to run, and here's some additional requirements I have, like give me a, a data source, give me a cache, give me whatever. Um, you don't get to define things like networking, for example. You know, the kind of the low level, the operational stuff, you might give some hints about how you want your application to be scaled such as you know, scale when you hit a certain threshold, but you don't define how that scaling should happen. That is the job of the platform to make that happen. So all this operational stuff, you know, logging, monitoring, um, auto-scaling, failover, all these things are things that the platform should worry about. And you know, going back to what we were saying, that is a classic operational concern, so that kind of makes sense. That is where the responsibility lies for this. Um, if you're working in this kind of model, at any given time, if you ask yourself, what is running in my production environment right now, every running service should consist of two versions, two deliverables, the app code and the platform version that it's running on. 
platform version may be shared, of course, but you need both of these pieces of information to say what is running. Um, ironically, a lot of cloud-hosted pass vendors don't give you much flexibility about the pass version. They know internally. Typically, it's represented as an API version, but you don't really have much control over it. If you're running this inside your own data center, things get a little bit different. And that's why I call this the pass model, because they, that's a, a common example of this particular type of setup. <clears throat> what else does it mean? How do apps actually get deployed? So this is only one of the many questions we can talk about. I just happen to pick this because that's what we do as a day job, so I can tell you a lot about this and hopefully provide some useful information. Typically, when you are updating an, an application in the past, you are keeping the environment version fixed because most of the time the environment version, the platform version, doesn't change very often in the first place. And secondly, it should be pretty backwards compatible. There shouldn't really be much um, dependency between the, uh, the platform and the application. And uh, because the application tier is quite a thin piece, you can actually make very efficient updates of that application tier. It's basically an in-place upgrade. You know, if you have an app server running somewhere, even if you don't see the app server, what a platform will do is it'll replace your app code inside the app server. It won't necessarily spin up an entire new VM with an entire app server on it and so on. Um, and even if you're working with containers, what actually ends up happening, of course, is it doesn't spin up a new underlying VM to install Docker on that VM and then give you a new container. It actually patches the existing container and reboots it which is a very efficient way of transferring the data around. But the good thing about this is that the developer doesn't have to care. This is the job of the platform. You know, doing the rolling hot update, making sure that one part of your application is always accessible, moving certain servers out of a load balancer, putting them back in, and so on. That is all uh, part of what the platform does. And that's nice, and it's very efficient, especially if you have complex stacks in which actually rebooting a new stack can be very expensive. You know, for those of you who have lived through things like WebSphere, WebLogic, you know, SAP, whatever. I mean, we're not just talking about like vanilla web apps here. Um, there are plenty of cases where the stack, the platform is so complex for it to be basically infeasible for you to install a new SAP instance just to change one line of configuration. It just doesn't make any sense. So this model works very well across a, a broad range of different types of, of technologies. One thing that is very important about this, I mean, I said one of the benefits of this approach is that it mirrors organizational responsibility. Well, I mean, who here has not been in a situation where you had an infra guy and a dev guy fighting about whose problem it was? In a, well, no, okay, it's a stupid question. It's difficult not to put your hand up. But anyway, um, yeah, so I've certainly lived through this. I'm sure a lot of you have as well. There's an application error. Something goes wrong. It's a SEV1. And of course, it's an app that's broken, and then, you know, you're trawling through the logs, trying to figure out, is it a configuration problem of the system? Is it a business logic error in the application? Lots and lots of shouting until you can eventually figure out who's responsible, and lots of wasted time. So one thing that is very important in these platforms, and in people like Google, I mean, their hosted configuration management service, for instance, they make it very explicit that a certain class of errors will be considered errors of the platform, and everything else is your problem development team. So you need to, if you're going to build a platform, invest some time in making it very clear when an error gets thrown, whether it's a, like a, an internal server error, if you like, internal platform error, or whether the platform did its job and you know, basically the app code threw some exception or something along those lines. Um, if it's a timeout connecting to the storage system and the storage system is provided by the platform, that needs to go to the platform team. This will, A, it will be a lot more efficient, and B, it will save you know, a lot of recrimination, a lot of shouting. So here's the thinker. So I'll, you know, just, I'm not going to take too long about this, maybe just 10 seconds to let people let that sink in a little bit and to figure out, to think about, you know, is this something that you see in your own setup? Um, are you working towards a different setup? Does this model actually apply? You know, how many of the, the, the benefits or advantages do you see in your own, uh, in your own environment? Plus, it gives me a chance to have a drink of water, which is also good. Well, that was a very, I wasn't being too generous there with the time I had made. I'll just give you an example of what, of how we try to make this look like in our tool. Uh, of course, I'm more than happy for you to try it out, but many tools you can use to do this. 
Of course, we try to do exactly this in one of our tools, our deployment tool, and that is based around exactly this concept. Uh, and also based around the realization that most of the companies we speak with, you know, this model fits very nicely, both across the different technology stacks that they have, and it matches their organizational setup pretty well. Uh, it's easy for them to adopt, and of course, as a products company, easy adoption is a, is a critical goal for us. So here you can see that platform boundary, if you like, running right down the middle of the screen to some extent. On the left-hand side, you have all the application code, and these are these packages that can consist of pretty much what you want them to consist of. Here there's an example with like the classic stuff, you know, ear files and, and proxy settings for Apache and maybe some tests and some web content and all that kind of stuff. But application packages can consist of lots of other things. They can consist of ServiceNow or Salesforce configurations. Uh, they can consist of Docker containers. They can consist of whatever you consider the developers as being responsible for delivering. And then on the right-hand side, you have the environments. That's what developers don't care about. That's what should just work. They just say, look, I want to get my app running, this, all my stuff over in this particular environment, and then it should just be made to happen. And it's, I mean, the job of our tool or any other deployment tool to just make that deployment plan work for you. And so as a developer, it should just work and you shouldn't care about it. And of course, if something goes wrong, you should get a notification that this happens. Um, from the operational side, you know, these environments, I mean, a lot of, in a lot of organizations, these environments are still things that are kind of, they were created once at the dawn of time, and nobody please touch them because it was so difficult to set them up, and most of the people who set it up don't work here anymore, and we have no idea how it's configured, but the reason we're at a salt event is because people are trying to move away from that, which is great, um, to the point where setting up an environment is something that should happen at the click of a button based on some kind of version template, and so, you know, we don't, we don't do that part. We will happily allow you to delegate to Salt or Amazon or you know, whatever provisioning technology you want to use. But that is then what ultimately gives rise to the environments that developers deploy to. And you can either decide that you know, the platform team controls the creation of environments, or you can have the environments created on the fly, or you can have some kind of self-service mechanism in which developers can request an environment, and then you know, when their quota is up, they have a problem or whatever but there's some kind of policies you can put in place around that to get the monkey off your back. Because you know, everybody in operations that I've ever worked with, and when I did a, a short stint, I had this as well. You know, the question comes up every day, why am I sitting here spending time on some support ticket with some annoyed developer who wants something configured in a test environment, which is clearly not that important. Of course, it's important to him or her because that's what they're waiting for. But I have other problems. So if you can self-service this, then, then there's a definite benefit here. All right, that was the, the Dev plus Ops, Dev Ops capital O platform team uh, type view of the world. Now we'll talk about the, you know, the other option in this space um, that, that is often read, uh, written about and talked about and uh, suspiciously written and talked about more than people actually can come up with credible examples of this really working in, at scale. But that's a different discussion. Uh, I was gonna pick a picture of an American football team uh, first but then I realized that American football teams are a really bad example because they have two teams. In fact, they have multiple teams for different purposes. So they're really perhaps better example of a platform team. So this is a, the US national soccer team where indeed everybody has to do everything. There's 11 people on the, on the field, on the pitch, and you can't say, look, no, we're defending now, so let's just take half the team off and put another team on. I always found that really interesting about, about American football. Nice specialization of duties there. So maybe socks compliant sport. Um, okay. So one plus one equals three. Um, what does a full stack development team look like? What does it look like to work in this kind of setup? Um, well, what, first of all, what are some of the benefits? Well, some of the benefits are if you have your development developers and the developers who end up defining operations, virtual environments, and data centers, if they can both work together on what becomes a shared code base, they can help each other um, because parts of the way the code is written in one part, like the data center definition, the virtual network setup, will affect other parts of the system. You know, if you're setting up a, a, a storage cluster, um, the latency between the nodes in your storage cluster will have an enormous impact on the performance of the system. And if you know that, then you can design the system to take that into account, or you can decide that you need a different data center setup. But of course, you can only know that if both groups can look at the overall the picture, the big picture, and can figure out what's going on. 
And then they can spend their time, you know, rather than trying to eke the last crazy bit of app performance out of the code by inlining methods and all kinds of strange things, they can figure out that a much better way to address this symptom might be to change the operational structure, the way the app is deployed or the, the, the regions in which it's running or whatever. So, you know, we can do different things once we see the big picture. Um, sharing knowledge. Uh, I mean, one of the, the big things we suffer from culturally, I guess, as a, as a, as a dev and this is part of where the, the original DevOps movement really came from, was this Cold War-ish lack of understanding between two groups. And uh, to me, that's a bit ironic nowadays, because both groups are really doing the same thing. They're both developing software. They're just developing different types of software. It's no longer the case that one group really is our engineers to some extent, and the others are more like artists and cooks. Uh, now we're both basically software developers. Um, and so there should be, since we, we have shared experiences, shared working environments and so on, there should be a much, a much better opportunity nowadays than before to actually uh, identify that we're really in the same cultural environment. And, and therefore, you know, we're buddies, we're colleagues. We share the same experiences, suffer the same pains. Can we help each other? There's different types of shared knowledge that I'm talking about when I talk about this particular thing. Um, there's both the bottom, top to bottom knowledge of the stack. Operations people tend to have more knowledge of the bottom part of the stack, you know, where the systems run and, and how the middleware is configured if you have middleware and so on. And developers obviously understand their business code. Um, but there's also the left to right part of the process, um, you know, from development through to production. Because code doesn't just live in one environment, it typically propagates through multiple environments until it gets into your production setup. And again there, developers tend to know more about the, the dev part environments, because that's the ones they set up and optimize for their development process and rapid feedback and all that kind of stuff. Ops tend to know more about the production part of the process where there are additional technologies in place like in the monitoring or firewalls or security or whatever. Um, and you will never, I mean, it's, a, it's madness to think that magically everybody on the team will understand that entire rectangle and be able to you know, tackle every specific part of it. That never happens. Um, but that's also not the point. The point is to realize that you know, if we can have an integrated team, then there is a significant area of overlap in terms of the knowledge, and that this area of overlap, these knowledge overlap zones, are the important ones. You no longer have knowledge, 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 total ignorance, total ignorance. Those areas where there are impacts on each other, there, there will be more shared knowledge by default because you end up talking about those areas more. You know, if your app is performing slowly because of some latency issue, that's something you're going to investigate with a shared team, and then you're going to have the ops people talk about the way the network is configured or the way the firewalls are in place or whatever. The database is slow because it's on a specific type of disk infrastructure. I don't know. And the developers are going to talk about you know, what kind of queries they're running, how often they're sending messages, and so on. So by default, the knowledge, will, the knowledge zones will kind of gravitate towards the challenges that you face. One big problem here, as I talked about, this should be easier to have a better collaboration because um, we're really doing the same thing. But, of course, in reality, it doesn't always work that way. Um, because operational development, if you like, tends to be a newer discipline than development development, um, it's not uncommon to see um, developers thinking that you know, they've solved all the problems and they're way ahead of the curve and they've got all these cool practices and they have a whiteboard and they stand up at 8 o'clock every morning and so they must be much smarter than all these operations people who are basically just hacking up shell scripts and now prevent that they can develop. And that's, you know, it's obviously a total prejudice, um, but that's something we need to be aware of and we need to combat. So mutual respect here is absolutely critical. Yes, develop, development developers in certain organizations will have more um, experience in quote unquote official development practices and things like OO design and whatever. But they usually have very little experience of how stuff actually ends up running in production. And our shared goal should be as a team to get stuff running in production because that's where our users can use it. And I, don't, I mean, that's not necessarily even from a business perspective. Like, of course, there's no business value if something isn't in production. That also should be from our perspective as professionals in our field. We should have pride in getting useful stuff into the hands of the people who are actually paying for our services. Now, I've, I've been on development teams, and I've done this myself, where I was proud of 
the fact that we didn't have mixed spaces and tabs in our source files. I've been on operations teams where we were proud of the way we were able to like, use one shell command with all these funky aliases to do like, stuff on 100 machines. At the end of the day, who cares? That's a bit like a, a chef only caring about how efficient they can use different pots and pans and not caring about whether the food that comes out at the end is any good. Or a surgeon who cares about how neatly they can stitch and who doesn't care about whether the patient lives or dies. That's, that's something that I think we as a, as a profession need to internalize a little bit that we can do better um, at this level. And then once we have this shared goal, then of course we can also develop mutual respect for what we, each other can contribute to making this goal happen. Um, in practical terms, uh, when you do DevOps with a lowercase o, if you like, of course there is still a shared foundation. Um, most of the time you're going to be running maybe in the same data center or maybe you're going to be running on the same hypervisor, like VMware, EC2, whatever, OpenStack. Um, but this is fairly far down in the stack. So you're very close to the kind of the utility level, if you like. Um, pretty much everything that's built on top of that, um, and quite wide-ranging parts of the stack, you know, from the storage decisions to the, uh, the networking to the, the middleware that runs on it to the application code to the databases, all that kind of stuff. That is basically part of what this integrated team develops, a single version entity that is, this is my stack, version 4.7 or whatever, um, and yeah, I consider that a virtual appliance because again, it's nothing really new. You know, if you download F5 Big IP, for instance, from, you know, uh, I think it's from Big IP, like the virtual load balancer, then this is what you get. You get some system that's ready baked. They've done all the work to figure out all the internals of that system and all you need to provide is this very low level foundation of a hypervisor and then they will take care of the rest. And you can get it in different versions. So, the deployment model, if you're doing DevOps with a lowercase o, isn't what we were talking about earlier because A, it can be pretty difficult based on the technologies that you use, say you use salt. It's not very easy or, or logical in the model to say, well, I only want to update like three of the components on eight of these servers because that, you know, the systems treat components or servers as entire entities. So you're really you know, and, and that doesn't, that from a versioning perspective, that doesn't mean anything either because what do you have then? You have like an in-between. You have no longer version 3.7, but not quite version 3.8. It's like version 3.7 with a bunch of changes, which as we have learned is not necessarily a smart place to be. So um, the deployment model here tends to be more along the lines of, you know, make a clone of the instance or the image uh, and then reroute all the traffic to the, to the new setup. Um, and in fact, what often happens is that people have Netflix, for instance, they have a, a kind of A-B type environment where the pre-production environment, um, when they're happy that this is the right one, that becomes the production environment. And then they tear down the production environment and they build that fresh and that becomes the new pre-production environment. And then when they're good, they move the traffic over again. And so you always have one production environment, one pre-production environment. But the important thing is that you're basically setting up the entire system and then you're just moving the traffic over. Uh, and this can have implications. Like if it takes eight hours to run one of these things, if you have a very complicated system where you're moving gigabytes and gigabytes of data around, you need to be aware that this can become a bottleneck and you either need to accept it and be okay with it or you need to live, find technologies that can try to instantiate an entire stack very quickly, which is one of the compelling or supposedly compelling features about containers nowadays in that you can kind of define the entire thing, but that it's less heavyweight than traditional VMs. And the other thing, so what does this give you? Well, this gives you the team a tremendous amount of flexibility in terms of what they're going to deliver. Um, but the reality is that, you know, we're grown-ups, unfortunately, if you ask me, but uh, I'd rather be a kid again. But, more flexibility comes with more responsibility. You can't have your cake and eat it. You can't say, well, um, I want to use this crazy new beta version of some kind of node storage technology I found, and I want to link it together in this non-standard way because my app is designed in some crazy way that it needs that, but then if it breaks, we're going to call support. Um, you know, you need to, you need to, well, you need to admit that you've made these decisions, and so it becomes your responsibility um, to actually run them. And this is what, you know, this is not a new thing. You've heard this or read this many times. Um, no, you get the pager. And I think this needs to be part of the, the expectation of this model from the outset. Um, and I'll talk a little bit in a second about some hybrid models where you can give people both options. You can say either you can build 
less flexible apps in which everything just works and then you don't get the pager. Or you want to do all kinds of crazy stuff and then you pay the price. Um, so I think that that's, a, that's an interesting one, but we'll get into that in a second. So then let's have another thinker moment um, to briefly think about, you know, does that apply? Are you already in that situation? Would that make sense for you? Um, what would the challenges be? I get to take another sip of water. Let me accelerate here a little bit because we don't have that much time. Okay, so what does this look like? Um, so this is one of our other tools. This is our kind of end-to-end -end pipeline tool. If you're going to implement this, you can't really read it, I guess, because of the screen resolution. But if you're going to implement something like this, then you know setting up an environment and the app at the same time should be a very nice, easy, one-click operation. If you're doing like testing, so these are the sample phases in your flow. This would be like testing, QA, and then production. Um, it's just a single action. And here we're invoking salt because we're at saltconf, but you could invoke anything, of course, to do this. Um, and then, you know, in these environments, you typically don't have to reroute any traffic. You just stand up a brand new environment, perfect, load it with some data, and then run some tests. When you get into production, you might spin up a new candidate, and then you might verify that with some smoke tests, and then you might decide to switch the traffic over. Very easy, very nice. And then you know, this, you know, XR release is designed to help you see the entire end-to-end -end picture because, of course, you don't just spin up environment. You spin it up to do stuff with it. Um, and then you, know, you want to be able to track where your progress is as you move along. But from a, uh, a deployment perspective, it obviously simplifies things quite a lot because it's just a single action. Make me a new everything. Um, it's just a question of whether, you know, whether the trade-offs work well for you. OK, so much for those two different approaches. Now for the, uh, the section where we talk about trying to figure out which one may or may not make sense or combination in your particular setup. So as you would um, probably expect from all the things I've said so far, I don't think anymore that there is one answer to rule them all. And, and I think any blog post you read in which somebody dogmatically says, this is the only way you must do it, is frankly, um, I'm just say, is not seeing the full picture. And I think they're making a mistake that we will, we will see in a second. Um, Basically, it depends on your context. Now, now I'm sounding like a consultant. I'm not a consultant, but unfortunately, part of that is reality. The question, some of the questions you need to ask yourself. If you're going to go for the platform model, do you have the resources, the capability, the skills to build a rock-solid, reliable platform that just works? And do you have the ability to force, cajole, motivate developers to develop to its constraints? Um, the reason Google can do this, the guy I spoke to on the phone, is because Google has some pretty awesome engineers at building platform stuff. And yes, they're supporting Docker right now. They don't use that in production. Um, they have their own uh, configuration management system. They don't use any off-the-shelf product. So they've got a huge, huge engineering resource and capability dedicated to this. And it has brilliant results, but it doesn't come for free. Um, they can also tell their developers, look, you want to write code here? If you don't adhere to these standards, you can go straight back and write it again, because we don't care. If it doesn't meet these standards, it's not going to run. Google can do this because they employ all these developers. When you start to buy off-the-shelf software, or if you have outsourced development, or if you're just in an organization where development has a huge amount of like, intrinsic traditional power, like a very powerful VP of dev who's able to push through all decisions, this is a much harder thing to do. Because developers will usually get their way. Um, and the other thing is, of course, if you're not going to go for the platform model, do you have an organizational structure that could work with the notion of an end-to-end an -end team? You know, can, you make the, can you make the reporting structures work? Can you make the knowledge sharing work? You know, that's not something that's easy to do if everybody is totally remote. Can you get people together often enough? Um, are there language barriers that you need to address? Uh, all these kind of things that, that are not intrinsically technical at all, but they impact your ability to have an effective integrated or not team. You know, are you looking to outsource? Do you have a history of outsourcing? Blah, blah, blah. There's lots of questions around this that need to be asked before you can decide which model works best for you. What's important is that you, well, long story short, you have to have one of the two. Both is good, arguably, um, 
unnecessarily hard to do. Because if you have a brilliant platform, it's probably going to be pretty sophisticated. And developers don't need or maybe even don't want to understand it. Um, but it's really problematic if you have neither. In other words, you don't have a powerful platform. Um, but developers don't have the flexibility uh, to run what they need to run. Because then you end up with shadow IT. Then you end up with frustration. Then you end up with you know, inability to deliver to the business because everything just takes years and so on. So you need to, I think, think about having one or a combination of those models. But you should not feel pressurized that any particular tool stack is the right way to do this. The conceptual model is what matters. Uh, whether you know, Netflix uses um, Val, what, oh, no, it's not Valgrind. It's um, ah, there, it's Vagrant. I'm always forgetting it. It doesn't matter. Asgard, um, or whatever other tool that they've written in the meantime on top of EC2, or whether you want to use I don't know, OpenShift on top of OpenStack, or whatever. Just because some company uses some particular technology stack doesn't mean you have to adopt it. It's, it's the model that they're trying to get at that's important. And let me just emphasize this. this is, I've said this a few times. It's totally OK to realize that for different teams or different organizations or different business units or whatever, you may have different answers to this question. I was speaking at a, at a GE summit recently, and, and they, they got a lot of good responses to this because they're struggling internally a lot with the problem that from a top-down initiative, there's some pressure to enforce a very rigid platform that clearly doesn't work for a, non, a substantial portion of the business applications that they actually write. Uh, and because they're not giving development teams the option to do DevOps with a lowercase o, you know, okay, we need to get this to run. We'll happily take the responsibility for it. That's not an option that's on the table. That's causing a lot of friction. And I think what they're maybe moving towards, which is a model where you can say, you know, you want the pager, that's fine, and you can do what you like. You want us to take the pager, then you have to live with these constraints. That, I think, is a model that is, uh, is very nice and applicable. All right, so, uh-oh, need to speed up here. We'll cut short our reflection of Rodin. So enough about the, like, how do we do this already? We can do expedition planning as much as we like. We can talk about tools and tips and tricks and so on. Let's take a little step back, and I'm going to talk a lot faster now. Yes, we benefit from all this stuff. It's good to have runtime platforms. It's good to have shared understanding. It's very hard to phrase that or to put numbers against shared understanding and go to a CIO and said, I now want six months and 10 people in order to make this initiative happen. The shared focus, of course, is getting, you know, building stuff and getting it running. And if we can do that faster and more efficiently, then if we don't break stuff, we definitely have a quantifiable benefit. Um, I'm not necessarily, so, so some common goals, that's not the only goal, faster time to market there. Uh, which is actually really a goal of continuous delivery. You know, getting apps out faster is not something I intend to think of as being an operational problem necessarily. But it's one that is nowadays very tightly coupled to DevOps simply because it seems to be the best way of defining some quantifiable benefit. Um, there are some common goals that you, know, you can have fast time to market. You can have, the one thing I should say, being DevOps, I've heard it, that's not a goal. Whenever somebody says being DevOps is a goal, then I say you don't have a goal because being DevOps is not a goal. It's a means to achieving something. If you say that, then you don't really know what you're doing, and you're never going to know whether you've got there. Because as we saw this morning, there is no definition of what DevOps is. So you can't say we've reached it or you haven't. Failed end user transactions, an interesting one. Um, faster time to recovery. Now we're getting into more classical operational things. Um, reduced expenditure, doing stuff more cheaply. Um, running stuff more cheaply, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole bunch of different goals that, that I think legitimately come up in this discussion. And I think what's important is that you don't just pick, you know, if you like, off-the-shelf goals. Choose goals that are relevant to your business. This is a very interesting example. This is at a Splunk conference. The GE Capital CIO pointed to these three as their particular main goals for their initiative. And I thought the last one was specifically interesting because the first two are pretty standard. That's you know, reduced failures and uh, faster time to market. The last one is a very industry-specific problem. It's not something you would typically see in another industry, but they spend so much time and effort satisfying audit requirements that they realized that that was a key thing that they wanted to optimize for in their DevOps approach. And I think that's interesting because it shows, yeah, think about the business you're in, um, and, and that will help you identify what your main goals are. So we don't have much time for the thinker right now. Where do you go for from here? Well, you come to the booth, except that the booth doesn't exist anymore. But then who needs swag? I'm sure you all have a bunch of t-shirts already. And if you're really interested in something like the one I'm wearing, um, Heather, I'm sure, can help you out. Here's my action plan. 
This is what I normally do um, when I start. And since a lot of you may already have started, you may be halfway through this. In that case, this may not be totally applicable to you. But if you see some steps that I mentioned that you haven't done, it might be worth thinking about whether it's worth trying to catch up on those. So the first thing, why are we doing this? And have measurable goals. Now, even if they're like, we want happier developers, so we're going to run a survey to find out how happy they are, or ops people, have measurable goals. Because if you don't have those, you will never know whether you're doing the right thing. Pick one or two showcase teams that are, for which these goals are relevant, and decide that you're going to work with these. This is a big challenge. Because the tendency, or the challenge in, is to choose high profile ones, because the tendency is to be risk averse and to choose very insignificant ones. That's true, but there will, there will then never be the, the pressure or the visibility that even if you get it perfect for an insignificant thing, nobody cares. By choosing a reasonably high profile part of your business, part of your stack, results that you will definitely achieve if you do this reasonably well will be very visible at all levels and will give you all kinds of justification and motivation for rolling this out globally. You want the CIO to sign a big check for Salt Enterprise? This is the way to do it. Not by using it in some open source project for some website that 10 people look at and nobody cares about, because it doesn't generate ever any revenue. Once you know which projects you're going to work with, pick an approach that works for that project. DevOps capital O, DevOps lowercase o, decide what you need there. You know, whether the platform that you may run internally works for them. And then, of course, don't immediately dive in head first and probably screw things up because the first time you do anything, it doesn't work. Give yourself a couple of months or weeks or whatever to try out how you want to implement this. Put together a tool stack. Put together a process. You know, get replicate environments of their stuff. Do it in a non-critical place where you can learn the hard lessons about what works and what doesn't work for you without um, basically blowing things up in production and killing your initiative straight away. Once you feel that you have enough confidence that you at least know what you're doing, okay, so don't spend two years on this because then it's going to be too late and you'll run out of money, take a baseline of the goal metrics that you had. Don't forget to do this because I know many people who immediately rush into DevOps and then they find it very difficult to demonstrate how they benefited because they don't know how bad things were at the start. Then apply your experiment and show the results. And be very visible about them. Because hiding bad results is a natural tendency. But that's ultimately what we all need to learn. Because it's the first, you know, it may not be the perfect approach. If it's good, then it's great to be highly visible. If it's not good, at least you'll be talked about. There'll be awareness of what's going on. And you'll get a chance to fix things. Trying to do this silently is, is, is not going to help anyone. Right, with that. I'm almost done, and I'm a bit over time. So there's some resources about us as a company. Uh, yeah, we have, obviously, tools in this space uh, that can help with multiple of these approaches. Uh, we can give you demos. You can go to our site, try them all out. They integrate really nicely with Salt and a bunch of other technologies that you have, I'm sure. Uh, we can get the dev monkey off your back if you're an ops person. That was, I think, one of our slogans here. Um, and with that, I will say thank you all very much.